Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and as well, the, the team at the GRI, Global Committee on Sustainable Hospitality. Uh, my name is Willy Legrand. I'm a professor at the IU International University in Germany, and I have the honor to be an academic partner to this committee. And today, uh, it's all about net zero uh, approach and a question of boundaries um, to that concept. I have a maximum of 20 minutes to make the case. Uh, this presentation is also partly a response to the recent discussion actually we've had uh, at this committee on the concept of net zero building efficiency, the issues around um, embodied carbon, which was then taken on a little bit onto uh, the WhatsApp group actually. Uh, to set the generic framework, we can start by looking at asset value. There are a series of standard metrics that are used, which also includes building codes and red book valuation and other methods used in the hospitality industry. When we look at market value through income capitalization or discounted cash flow analysis, cost or sales approach, all of these things that we do actually in, in the, at universities. And all of those have got merits and, and deficiencies, but other factors play a role, location and brand, for example. Now, you know, all of this is taken into consideration. Ultimately, we derive some kind of value for the asset. Now, what is the true worth of that asset value beyond its financial component? I mean, are we really capturing the value and liabilities those assets actually have on society uh, current and future? As we know, we've talked about it in this group already, the built environment contributes roughly 40% of all the carbon emission, and it's under really intense scrutiny by the regulatory bodies, with buildings being a cornerstone of the EU Green Deal and decarbonization efforts. So, you know, from the point of view of a property asset manager, thinking forward really is about proactively working towards that value preservation and then looking at asset enhancement. And I think we mentioned it before, but we, you know, we have the technology, we have the know-how, the best practices are available. But if we look at the latest lodging econometrics trend report, we have about 6,200 properties uh, project on the construction. And how many of those are planned and constructed with really a net zero carbon in mind? And the, you know, the arguments that I've been talking about in the past is that those properties will join a stock of buildings with committed emission in a world which actually desperately seeks to reduce those emission. And here comes always the, comes the, you know, the question of stranded asset and the International uh, Renewable Energy Agency. I'm just trying to see here, it's not coming for some reason. Here we go, sorry about that. Here we go. Uh, the IRENA has a clear message to the real estate sector with an estimated you know, 10.8 trillion of stranded asset by 2030 in a business as usual scenario. And the bulk of this stranded assets are in buildings located in Europe and in, in, in the US, in fact. Um, when we look at the EU building stock, 85% are properties that were built before 2001 and 35% of those buildings are actually 50 years of age. And we're looking at 85 to 95% of the buildings that exist today will be standing by 2050 still. And most of the existing buildings really are not particularly energy efficient. Many rely on fossil fuel for heating and cooling. Uh, they have old technologies, many of them are wasteful appliances. And that includes also our hotel properties. And you know, stranding those assets can take place. Why? Because tenants and operators may shun those inefficient properties. Owners are stuck with major retrofittings, as we know, keeping up with carbon pricing, possibly decarbonization requirements. And the property becomes a little bit of a liability, both financially and to society at large. So the message is pretty clear. You know, Delaying actions to decarbonize increases the risk of stranded assets. And currently, the pace is really slow. Only 11% of the EU existing building stock actually undergoes some level of renovation each year. However, very rarely does that renovation work actually address energy performance of buildings. And I don't have the figures exactly for the hotel buildings in the EU, but across all buildings the EU, uh, in the EU, when we look at deep renovations, we look at you know, renovations that reduce energy consumption by at least 60% are carried out only in about 0.2% of the building stock per year currently. So you know, when you look at the overall goal of reduction in building emission in the EU, which is 60% by 2030 and a full decarbonization by 2050, at the rate at this pace, I mean, cutting the carbon emission from the building sector to net zero would actually require centuries. So you know, the key players are called to make really swift you know, decision that includes, of course, governments with carrots and sticks, uh, investors, developers, owners, which we have around this table. We should be able to actually see the value in a concept of net zero. And this is really what we want to talk about today. Uh, when we look also at the advent of science-based target, the expectation is that you know, setting those decarbonization target is aligned with the science of climate change mitigation, as said by the Paris Agreement, and originally with 
the two degree scenario threshold. Now the science target, um, science-based target initiative sets that framework for corporate target setting. And as you know, because we've talked about it in the past, um, the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance had the, uh, in 2017, the Global Hotel Decarbonization Report, which a clear set of guidelines with greenhouse gas emission reduction targets of 66% by 2030 and 90% by 2050 from that 2010 baseline. But really in practice, what are we looking at? Well, we, we have a net zero target by 2050 across many countries. And that's basically what it is. It's zero carbon emissions. So ultimately, you know, we're talking about 100% reduction from whatever baseline a company would choose. That's really what's happening. A net zero may also require the implementation of carbon dioxide removal or carbon capture technologies because we're already so much down the road that energy efficiency measures and probably renewable energy production may just not quite do the trick on the path to decarbonize societies. But if we go back to our buildings, you can see there are really many various approaches in understanding, interpreting, defining uh, building energy efficiency, looking at issues such as, and you have it on, on the front here, energy sourcing, on-site, off-site, renewable energy production. We're looking at on-grid, off-grid property, uh, direct, indirect emissions, et cetera. Now, you know, we'll stick here with zero energy building and net zero carbon uh, building. I, I will not be dwelling and talking about the EU energy performance of building directive. However, uh, you know, that sets the base for what is known as a nearly zero energy building. And since the exact energy threshold here are set by each member countries, taking in consideration sort of their own uh, regional climatic conditions and, you know, built in their national building codes. If we look at Germany, for example, the threshold for non-residential uh, building primary energy is about 75 kilowatt hours per square meters, while in Estonia, that'll be 100 kilowatt hours square, per square meters. So, and additionally, this, uh, the, the nearly zero energy building directive um, looks really at operational energy efficiency and the use of on-site on or nearby renewable energy, but does not include embodied carbon as we will discuss here. So let's start with something that is similar to the EU directly. And I'll just pick up on the zero energy building according to the US Department of Energy. And typically, we're, what are those buildings? Well, they're grid connected buildings with the energy delivered to the hotel through the grid can be from renewable or non-renewable sources. And that can be energy in the form of electricity, of course, or, or district heating or cooling, for example. And the building has, a, has got an on-site, um, you know, that is within the building footprint, if you will, renewable energy capacity. And this on-site renewable energy production system may actually supply the energy uh, to the building, thus reducing the need for delivered energy to the building, but also the energy can be directly exported or transferred to other users via energy networks. And this is then taken in co into consideration when you're actually doing the accounting uh, into the net delivery energy balance. So obviously, when you, know, when you have on-site renewable energy production system supplying the building with energy that helps to reduce the amount of delivered energy you need. But important in that concept from the, the US Department of Energy is, is the following, is that the actual annual delivered energy is less or equal to the on-site renewable energy exported. And that's really the basic understanding of that zero energy building as per the US Department of, of Energy. It's grid connected, it's very efficient, it's got on-site production capabilities and transfers the renewable to the network. Well, one thing I think that perhaps is important as well is, and it's worth noting it, we've only discussed about the concept of operational energy. That is the energy used in the operation, which obviously includes you heating, cooling, cooking, lighting, et cetera. Um, so that's really the world of scope one and scope two emissions. Scope one for the fuel you may burn for your kitchen uh, equipment and scope two for that delivered energy or cooling or heating. However, there's, and there's really, that there's the catch here because Emission from the supply chain and, and the value network of a hotel and its activities will actually also need to be addressed in a zero net zero plan. And so we're talking about scope three emissions here, and those can be located upstream or they can be located downstream. And when we think about upstream, you know, you may think about your outsourced laundry, which is already part of the HCMI. You may be thinking about the various uh, consumables that we have, food and beverage offers, but also the emissions from operating 
uh, supplies and equipment, your furniture, furniture, uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, your transport uh, of furniture to your hotel, all the way to employee commuting, uh, you know, the guest shuttle of, of transport of guests in and around, uh, your business travel, etc. And so the question comes, you know, I mean, should, how far do you go? Should you say, okay, employee housing, should it be in there? Or the guest flight, should it be in there? And this is really all about setting boundaries across the industry. And this is going to be very important here as we move forward. Now, downstream, scope three, we look at, you know, emissions from waste treatment, um, water treatment, waste transport, disposal, et cetera. And that really builds the entire picture um, and net zero require scope three to be addressed in fact. But let's face it, um, there are potential hundreds of source of emissions when you look both at upstream and downstream. And so what is critical here is to actually have a methodology which can be rolled across the industry. And this is currently the work that's being done actually. It's being done by Greenview in partnership with a sustainable hospitality alliance. And we have uh, actually partners here on this call, which is great. Now that work is being done and in a newsletter that was released in September by Greenview, they were mentioning that an announcement will be made about that net zero methodology for hotels during COP26 in Glasgow. So many of the questions raised here regarding those boundaries and accounting for the emissions, what will be included will probably be answered accordingly. And perhaps one last aspect, which I think is important to consider, especially with the crowd that we have here at this, at this table is, and it's major importance is the multitude of ownership and operating model that we have in place here. So when we think about setting boundaries and figuring out sort of the emissions, uh, it does become slightly more complex in this industry, in fact, because, you know, you might have a hotel that's actually part of a larger building and the hotel has got several floors of that building, but they're not the operator of the building. Um, and so, you know, you, you still have to figure out the, the emissions within this, or if you um, outsource uh, part of your building for, for the restaurant, for food, for example. But here too, that methodology should help to clarify some of those issues. So moving perhaps on my uh, last example, but this time we go back only to consider the building uh, and its, its, its value uh, and supply chain rather than scope three of everything else. So we'll just focus on the building here. And so the World Green Building Council and the UKGBC, which actually were welcome on the uh, GRI committee a few months back, argue that the concept of net zero carbon building should look at the various stages of a life of a building. And so when we start, we're looking at net zero carbon for operations. And that really looks at sort of the amount of carbon emission associated with the building's operational energy on an annual basis. And that should be zero or negative. That means a building which is highly energy efficient, powered by on-site and or off-site renewable energy sources, and with the remaining carbon balance offset. It also means, however, that net zero carbon in construction, when the amount of carbon emissions here associated with that building construction stages all the way up to completion uh, is zero or negative. And that will be achieved also through the use of offset or by net export of on-site renewable energy. But then there is one major component left out, and this is all about the maintenance of the life of that building. And of course, in the hospitality industry, we, you know, we, think, we think of emissions from the regular refurbishment cycles all the way to the end of the life of a building. And in fact, you know, we are then talking about this embodied carbon. And embodied carbon, there's an official, there's many official definitions. One of the official defici definition from the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors are that these are carbon emission associated with energy consumption and chemical processes during the extraction, manufacture, transportation, assembly, and replacement as well as, as deconstruction um, of that construction material or product. So that would include your refurbishment cycle with soft and hard goods replacement, for example, and the disposal of that old furniture. And so embodied carbon is often expressed, we, we talk about kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilograms of product or material. And so, you know, here we're looking at the life cycle approach and in a scientific sector, we undertake life cycle assessment to quantify those environmental impact. And in this case, we're talking about quantifying the embodied carbon, for example and all in, in all the associated stages of the life cycle of a building. And thus we're moving really from a pure zero energy building approach to a zero carbon building approach. And when we look at the life cycle assessment of buildings, there, there really are standards of what to look for. And this is particularly relevant since, you know, each building has got its own unique 
is unique in its own location in material and construction and so on. So there are tools available for professionals out there to conduct those life cycle assessment. Uh, one click LC or embodied carbon calculator for construction. Those are tools that are available out there. The University of British Columbia in Vancouver has got a really extensive program that, that does that looks at that at embodied carbon in buildings. Now, according to that European standard, I'm just trying to move my slide here. Here we go. And the standard 15804, the LCA, so the life cycle assessment scope for buildings include the different stages, such as the product stage, right? So raw material extraction, for example, uh, the construction stage, transport installation, the building usage, which is where we often focus, that's, you know, that includes your maintenance, repair, refurbishment, as well as your operational um, energy and water. And we have as well the end of life stage when a building is being demolished, for example. And then there's an additional uh, part, which is the beyond boundary when uh, material from the building can be reused and recycled. Now, this really sets similarly to what I've just mentioned before, the boundaries from a building's perspective on embodied carbon. And the estimates are very difficult to make for our industry or generally speaking, but considering sort of the, the, the refurbishment cycles that we have of four, five to seven years, embodied carbon makes up anywhere between 30 and 70% of a typical building's life cycle emission. Now, of course, embodied carbon varies greatly on the type of construction when you have uh, you know, reinforced concrete or steel construction. Uh, from the type of facade uh, to finishes, when you have aluminum wind window frames or plenty of glass, that will result in substantial upfront carbon embodied into uh, the building. And we also have some, uh, in the WhatsApp, we had an interesting discussion as well on the emissions of newly built building versus refurbished building. And of course, granted, newly built properties are often more efficient um, in operational energy, but often come with plenty of upfront embodied carbon. And I was digging research the last couple of weeks about this. Um, there's more and more research actually being done on there. There's one research which I thought was I would highlight it's the empirical findings, and it's based on it's based on 26 buildings. So there was 14 newly built product and project and 12 refurbished project, and it was a mix of residential office buildings, including four hotels. And what it came out is that the mean embodied car for refurbished building was 33 to 39% lower than newly built uh, project. And they are I calculated the cost as well on the per square meters of floor area and the cost for refurbished buildings it was anywhere between 22 to 50% lower than newly built project. So anyways, last slide that takes us back uh, to considering the whole life cycle carbon of our hotels, embodied and operational carbon, of course. And I'm pointing out to, uh, to Katrin here at IHG because there was a white paper that was prepared by Arup, Gleeds, IHG, and Schneider Electric earlier this year called Transforming Existing Hotels to Net Zero Carbon. Great source of valuable information based on case studies, which I recommend for everyone. And on page 17 of that report, they present a graph, which basically I have taken and slightly modified. We have two axes with the Y axis being the carbon emissions intensity of hotel buildings. And of course, you know, when we look at the overall life cycle, the whole carbon life cycle, a fair share is upfront, upfront embodied carbon from construction material. And this is followed by operational carbon. And since the aim is for continuous improvement, we can see that operational carbon will be decreasing over time. However, what happened next is something quite typical of hotels. Because why? Because we enter regular cycle of refurbishments, minor, major renovations, upgrades, technology upgrades, and the cycles are short, anywhere between four and seven years these days, technological upgrade on a much shorter cycle. And really, the result is regular spikes, in fact, of embodied carbon along the way of that building. Hence, the probability that embodied carbon may be as much as 70% of all carbon emissions in our hotels. And as mentioned as the start of this presentation, embodied carbon are scope three emissions which need to be accounted as you know, for as we move towards a net zero approach. And in the case of both operational and embodied carbon, much of the ability really to deal with those emissions is actually upfront during the building and system design, the planning stages, when the material is actually being specified, when, when we're actually setting the performance criteria here, decision will actually have an effect over the next 30 years, both on operational carbon and on the intensity of upfront embodied carbon, which we'll need to take in consideration in that net zero approach. 
And, you know, ultimately, and that is going to be my last statement, ultimately, without necessarily coming back to the risk of stranded asset, uh, wise choice now will be reflected in the overall hotel asset value because it can be expected that building values will further deviate actually from standard metrics. Uh, you'll have components such as, you know, the changing uh, sustainability requirements of occupiers and investors will have the impact of ESG uh, legislation, the changing costs of meeting sustainability standards. And all of this is weighing ultimately on the financial success of a business. And if we go back to discounted cash flows or capitalization rate, then obviously that will affect the valuation of a business asset accordingly. And that was it for me. I don't know if I'm in 20 minutes, but I, I was trying. Okay. Thank you very much.